Hello, my name is Michael Pearson. I'm a professor at Fordham University, and I'm also the president of the International Humanistic Management Association. And together with the Humanistic Leadership Academy, I'm happy to present you uh, one of the foundation courses for the certification. This segment of the certification is really focusing on the foundations of what we call humanistic leadership. And what the aspiration is that we can educate business students to do business and basically manage any organization more consciously. I probably don't need to tell you that the state of the world is challenging. Many challenges around us seem intractable, unsolvable, complex, volatile, and it seems like the challenges are only adding up in terms of war, conflict, the effects of climate change, corruption, social division, etc. Now, if you want to make yourself feel bad, you can look at what uh, may be signs in which way we can actually predict near-term human extinctions. And in many ways, <clears throat> this points to the fact that humans need nature. By all accounts, nature, the planet, will survive because nature does not need humans. And much of the potential conceptual criticism against a humanistic perspective is that it's seemingly human-centric. But here I just want to make sure that we understand human beings as being part of nature and therefore humans needing nature. And the best that we can do as human beings at this point and as conscious and humanistic leaders is to assure that we can actually survive on this planet. Are we set up for that? Not really. Now, these uh, comedic relief efforts of The Office or Dilbert may be familiar to you. You may have, in different contexts, other versions that parody the absurdity of organizational life. But in many ways, we know that our current organizations aren't really cutting it. We're not organizing for survival. In fact, we have data that showcases that many people, the majority, the large majority, is actively or not engaged in their work in the organization. So we're not really setting ourselves up to organize for survival. Do we need better leadership? The answer seems to be a resounding yes. Some people say we have a pandemic of bad leadership. Larry Fink, who you see pictured here, is one of the Wall Street titans managing a fund that varies between $10 trillion and $12 trillion managing, uh, managed money, uh, mostly pension funds, and therefore having a little bit more of a long-term perspective. He and others on Wall Street are concerned about the state of corporate leadership, but I think many of us see and our students are concerned about general societal leadership as well, political leadership. So yes, we do, different, we do need better leadership, that's for sure. We do need a different type of leadership. And in many ways, what we're talking about a lot in the corporate uh, world and in business schools is sort of the letter soup type of approach to shifting leadership. We're adding ESG, CSR, DEI, GD, uh, GDP, whatever, GRI, all the kind of letters that oftentimes point to uh, a deficiency, I'll say, of the current model. And we seem to want to add on something to the existing dominant model. Stuart Hart calls it a saddlebag approach. And I will argue this is not very effective. Do we need a new operating system? 
yes, we do need new leadership, and I think we need a new system, an operating system. And I'm making the comparison here with the time that Steve Jobs, that many of you might remember, was leading Apple and came up with the iPad. And at the time, most of our devices that we used to be on the internet were stationary. And the dominant software for internet uh, traffic uh, for mostly picture, image, and sound was called Flash. But it was designed for stationary computing, not mobile computing. But it was dominant. At one point, Steve Jobs said, we're not going to support Flash anymore. Flash is buggy and crashes max. It's a CPU hog and a source of security holes. So we're going to dump it. I think we need to do the same thing with the way that we use our current mindset or operating system for leadership as well. No add-ons, but really replacement. So here is the analogy that I want to offer you, is that we need a new kernel to actually get towards better leadership. Uh, in software development, you make a distinction between at least four levels of applications. And one of the core thing is the kernel. That is the machine, the language that uh, communicates, uh, lets hardware communicate with software, with the human ultimately. On top of that, we have an operating system. And then we know that we have the Apple system. Uh, the Mac OS, we have the Windows system, we have the Unix system, we have the Linux system, etc. They all use different kernels and they're representing an operating system that's different in scope and scale and, and look. And then we're offering operating uh, at the application level different programming and some of them work in the operating system and some of them don't. And then we talk about the user interface uh, changes, etc. And oftentimes in our conversations about leadership and the shift in leadership and management, I would argue we're staying at the user interface. We're looking at maybe what we need to report differently, maybe another uh, sustainability uh, project, maybe a, a volunteer day here or there, but really nothing shifts at the operating system. We still may be producing at the company level things that are toxic. Uh, we have a culture that may not fit uh, the application level in different ways. What we do is actually not impacted very much by shifts in the user interface, okay? So what we're talking about with humanistic leadership is really a dramatic shift of the paradigm at the level of the kernel, the operating system, the application level, and the user interface. For that, we need to change mindsets, right? The current problems require a new perspective. And as Albert Einstein said, problems cannot be solved with the same mindset that created them. Steve Jobs said, we need to replace the operating system built on a new kernel for the mobile computing time, and we therefore need to nix Flash. In a similar way, that's what needs to happen for humanistic leadership. Changing mindsets it not, is not easy. You may have heard about this story. I think it was the... Uh, a poet that used it in a, in a commencement speech. And he was saying, a fish meets friends in the water and says, morning boys, how's the water? And the two fish say, what the hell is water? So what is the operating system? What is the kernel? What are the applications in that sort of distinction here? They're the water. They're the water that we swim in. And what we need is, in that analogy, better programmers, leaders, educators, to actually make us aware of the water that we're in and then help us shift the mindsets that create it and reinforce it. I offer two basic metaphors to think about the operating system that needs to shift. One is the economistic model that's here represented by this triangular sandwich. And the other one, is the humanistic model that's represented by
by the bagel. You may be familiar with Donut Economics by Kate Rayworth, so that's borrowed from her metaphor as just juxtaposed to another uh, uh, perspective of the sandwich that I think tells us what the operating system is in the dominant model of management and leadership. And I want to make sure that we are not dismissing this dominant model immediately because that's easy to do and people say it's stupid, etc. Um, but we need to understand why it is dominant. And in that model, there is responsibility. And there is the responsibility for almost like an ethical reason towards the shareholder. And the responsibility remains for any leader to maximize, to maximize, let's say, a market share, to maximize uh, the size of the organization, to grow, to make acquisitions, to maximize the profitability or maybe the turnover. So responsibility and good leadership in this economistic model is the maximization of whatever variable you're looking at. It could include, at the political level, GDP. And we often have these uh, press articles that tell us that leaders are great when they improve the growth of the GDP. On the flip side, the humanistic model uh, offers a different perspective in which there are two conditions. One is that we recognize that growth is not unlimited, that there are planetary boundaries, that there are physical boundaries of how much we can use and reuse and uh, trash. So that's the outer boundary that uh, you can call the planetary boundary. But then there's also a key central piece that is critical to the humanistic management perspective, which is the notion of dignity, the inherent value uh, of people in a way that, yes, we need to basically make available life, a dignified life for all humans so that actually the rest of us, all of us, can live in a safe and just operating zone for humanity. Those are the words by Kate Rayworth. Uh, you can say the bagel zone or you can say uh, we need to manage for the common good. There are two background narratives that support the dominant narrative, the dominant operating model, the economistic model, and the humanistic model. The economistic story rests on the assumption of microeconomics, of homo economicus. This model was used to explain, in the very origin, behavior of humans in market conditions. And I would want to say that in this context, many of the assumptions are valid and helpful. And those assumptions are that we are utility maximizers, amoral, we are uh, asocial, and ultimately, yeah, in it for ourselves, much like Scrooge McDuck here seems to be. The alternative story, the humanistic story, focuses on the evidence of who we are as human beings through the lens of Homo sapiens. So I'll argue it's much more scientifically grounded and actually aligns with much of the wisdom of the traditional religious and uh, secular, uh, well, um, wisdom traditions, okay? The dominant mindset you could see has influenced the story of business and the nature of organizations, specifically the corporation, uh, has oftentimes been described as that of a psychopath, somebody who is amoral, somebody who just is in it for themselves. And any responsibility is a cost, and it requires external boundaries to put on this kind of beastly machine to behave somewhat uh, responsibly. 
Now there is an enlightened version of that perspective that says responsibility is a business opportunity and actually we can use it as a means to, end, to the end of profit. And that is also fitting in the story of the economistic uh, uh, nature. And in many ways, you'll see that in, in uh, traditional business literature. It's like, it's just better for business that you treat people well or that you behave responsibility. Cutting through this, I just want to offer for this conversation about humanistic leadership that we have much more knowledge, much better scientific grounding in terms of who we are as people. And that can be the foundation, the kernel for how we can build an operating system, like a management system, and then create teams, products, services around that, that actually solve and address some of the issues that we're talking about profitably. And we do really need a new story, a new kernel, to explain why people are motivated by more than just profit, why responsibility is relevant, and a certain type of responsibility and intrinsic uh, responsibility, and how we can actually be able to survive in and with nature. So William Gibson, no, John Nesbitt, let me correct myself. John Nesbitt said the most exciting breakthroughs of the 21st century will not occur because of technology. We love AI, we love social media, all of these things. They will not shift anything, really. But what he says, the real, real breakthrough will happen because of an expanding concept of what it means to be human. And in this next section, I just want to bring a bit of the evidence that's been collected over the years, mainly by uh, uh, Paul Lawrence of Harvard Business School that I had the privilege of working with, um, whose model I'm basically adopting for the sake of this uh, conversation. And what he found is that basically all the evolutionary biology and psychology and sociology, anthropology, etc., points to uh, an understanding of human nature that allows us to also come up with a notion of what leadership or what better leadership looks like. And he says there are, are four basic drives that humans have developed that need to be satisfied for us to be actually fully human and thriving and surviving. And those drives are the drive to acquire and the drive to defend. They were there in the stages when we were homo, habilis, etc. But then when we became what anthropologists call homo erectus and those variations, we actually developed a larger brain mass and therefore also the ability to be social. And Paul Lawrence calls that the drive to bond. But then as homo sapiens, we actually had to develop further even than that. And the prefrontal cortex, our brain development, made necessary or allowed us to think in the abstract. And what Paul Lawrence calls the drive to comprehend became an independent drive that we need to fulfill. Now let me get into a little bit more detail about this because this is going to be critical. This is the cornerstone of much of the possibility of humanistic leadership. So from Homo habilis to Homo erectus, we used to live, according to the evidence that we have, in forestry regions, in uh, regions where we were protected by the leaves, by the branches, and maybe by living higher up. And we didn't have to worry too much about the large animals underneath because we could hide on the trees. But when that climate change happened and when much of the rainforest, so to speak, transformed into savanna, we weren't, we weren't protected on the trees anymore. There were no trees anymore, so we had to go into the plain. And that's what people point to, this kind of shift from Homo habilis that could live maybe in, on the trees uh, and had to potentially even live on all fours, Australopithecus, etc., <coughs> to Homo erectus was really we, we then benefited from standing up, from developing 
uh, 3D vision uh, using the two eyes to actually focus on what's out there for us and really develop the sensory organs of vision more so than anything else. And uh, that is a shift that's massively uh, impacting who we are as human beings. Um, and our brain grew in that phase and it allowed us uh, to do a couple of things. Uh, one of the things that allowed us is to actually make use of each other. <laughs> we by ourselves couldn't do well surviving by ourselves. We were small. Big animals would have a feast, and they did. Uh, but in the context of um, the evolutionary history, those humans or humanoids survived that were able to collaborate. They could hunt together. And in fact, an additional sort of invention, <laughs> uh, harnessing fire, was another way of being able to survive as a tribe. So becoming more tribal was a key element in our survival. Becoming more social was key to our survival as a species. So we can't, we can't um, keep a fire burning by ourselves. We need others. If you've been a Boy Scout or if you've sat around the fire, you know, you need to feed it. You need to have people to do that. In many cultures, we actually elevated those that keep the flame to a higher status because they may be priests or others that would then allow everybody else to have the benefit of fire. But you can't do that by yourself. If you fall asleep, the fire will mostly die out. So those of us that survived so far are benefiting from our ancestors that were able to figure out how to use fire together and collaborate better and become tribal. We see that in the development of our skulls, that much of what happened apparently is that because we now had fire, we could outsource digestion. Think about it for a moment. A chimpanzee or a gorilla spend about one hour digesting leaves, or one eating leaves, and then 15 hours digesting. We used to be just like that, but that requires a lot of safety around you. And what we were able to do with using fire is we're actually shortening the digestion process because cooking actually helps us to digest. And we now have a conversation about ultra-processed food, etc. They're actually so much processed that we get oftentimes overweight by the consumption of it. But our nature tells us it's actually, yeah, a very quick way by cooking and industrializing food. We can actually outsource digestion. And we all remember that we have an appendix <laughs> uh, when it gets, uh, uh, well, incended then this hurts, but it's not a part of the, um, of the, of the uh, intestines that we still use, but it's sort of a remnant from a past, and it's still sort of in process that we reduce the intestinal tract, and actually that energy that we're saving goes into the development of the brain, and so you see the scaling of the brain size across the humanoids. And you see that actually from earlier humanoids to nowadays, we have more brain mass, more powerful brain mass. So the human nature evidence that we have, that we are all sort of part of in some way, is that we, by using fire, were able to have bigger prey and bigger brains. And we would benefit from having a tribe or nuclear family, and that helped us to survive. And Paul Lawrence calls this outcome an independent drive to bond. We like it when we're social. We dislike it when we're not. The biggest punishment we know of is isolation. Much of what we know about depression is that people feel by themselves, feel alone. Even though they're wealthy, they 
do not have a good life when they're feeling they're just by themselves. So just picture that. This is an independent drive. And it's an independent drive that's building on the drive to acquire the things that we need and, the, and, and defend the needs, the, the, the things that we, we need to survive. The drive to acquire and the drive to defend, and the drive to bond. In terms of the transition from Homo erectus to Homo sapiens, Pauline says there is another drive that emerged as independent, which is the drive to comprehend. And I just want to share with you that sort of maybe the outcomes of this independent drive. We love Sudokus. We play trivia quizzes. We uh, we are reading. We want movies. And all throughout the history that's documented about Homo sapiens, we see that there is organized meaning making and symbolism in organized religions, whether it's Christianity, Shintoism, it's Taoism, Hinduism, you name it. These are forms that correspond to a fundamental need that we have as Homo sapiens. Paul Lawrence calls it the drive to comprehend. And these chant this drive to comprehend, this abstract thinking allowed by the prefrontal cortex, helped us in our survival. It helped us to think in the abstract, which supported innovation. It helped us into storytelling, which supports learning. It helped us create shared meaning, like religion, that really helped also with the social cohesion. And we asked the question, why are we here? Those existential questions, who are we, why are we here, where are we going, are emerging when we are becoming homo sapiens. And so meaning making is fundamentally critical to survival of Homo sapiens, and it's an independent drive to comprehend. When we don't have a purpose, we don't feel fully human. Much of what we know about suicide is connected to a lack of meaning. And people sometimes, in even the most abject conditions, like in a uh, concentration camp, report to have been able to survive because they had meaning. So Paul Lawrence calls this the independent drive to comprehend. Now, why is this all relevant? It's nice stories, etc. But I think this gives us a different foundation to who we are and a different kernel. And Paul says these drives in human beings need to be balanced, not maximized. That's very critical. Let me repeat it twice. Those four drives in human beings, for survival's sake, need to be balanced, not maximized. We talk a lot about maximization and the maximization imperative. And you'll see books about maximizing purpose, maximizing trust, all of those things. But here, the key thing for humanistic leadership, that it's not a maximization game. When you lead well yourself and others, it's about balancing those four drives. What happens when you don't? What happens when you are maximizing one drive or the other, when imbalance occurs? This is the story of uh, an intern from Germany who wanted to really clinch this internship, I think, at a, well, an investment bank in London. And he worked 68 hours straight. And then there was something in his health that just sort of collapsed, and he died. You can think about people overeating. It's not helpful. It's not healthy. Too much is not good. We all know that. <coughs> But that's what happens when maximization is creating imbalance, right? We know, for example, folks like Bernie Madoff or others, their maximization of wealth and power goals actually can get them into trouble. Why? Because they are not considering these other drives of themselves and others in some ways. What happens? when we imbalance the drive to bond or maximize it. That's what you see right now, again, happening as a response almost to the maximization of the drive to acquire, uh, is people want to go back to a bonding experience. And so across the globe, you've experienced, seen movements that say, 
us first, the tribe first. Uh, it could be US, America first, the UK first, the Brexit, you know, the election of Donald Trump, uh, all of these kind of maximization imperatives where it's like, yes, we want us first. When you see the Nazis and the story of that, that's sort of a maximization that ultimately, if it's maximizing, not balancing, will end in conflict because others <laughs> will show up and one tribe better than the other tribe typically creates conflicts and violence is the result. Death is the result, as you see with some of these images here uh, from gangs that maximize really being part of the gang. The mafia is maximizing this cohesion in a way that is ultimately unhealthy. The drive to comprehend can also be maximized, and it's really not helpful. It's actually undermining survival. So the crusades, the jihadists, those that are sort of maximizing their meaning and ideology, oftentimes create conflict or want conflict or want to die for the bigger cause. So of course, in terms of survival, that's not very helpful. Maximization can also happen in the drive to defend, where people are saying, OK, I want to be safe, and safety is the biggest and most important thing. So they may want to isolate, live in huts, maybe are threatened by the world, bring a lot of guns in around them. Or, for example, in the medieval society in Europe, you see them have castles on the most exposed rocks where nobody would go. That was safe but it didn't really help the development, it didn't help the exchange of ideas, it didn't help the advancement of peace. In many ways, it was a warrior uh, society that actually didn't help the uh, survival of the species much, much, uh, species much. So again, this is the foundation, this is the new kernel that I'm talking about that is relevant as a building block for humanistic leadership. And this evidence from the evolutionary sciences, the natural sciences, actually aligns very well with the ancient wisdom traditions, philosoph philosophical insights, etc. And so um, Hans Küng, a theologian that I had also a privilege to work with briefly with a colleague called Klaus Dirksmeier, he, he uh, proposed that actually all of the major religions have shared universal values around the notion of human dignity and treating people humanely and the golden rule. And uh, Hans Küng at the time even said that Darwin was actually very accurate and Darwin for, for most people is seen as the proponent of this economistic ruthless management model. But if you read The Descent of Man, he has a whole chapter dedicated to that morality is actually a natural outcome of selection <laughs> that would allow a tribe, a society to work more cohesively and better together and therefore increase survival chances. So morality is beneficial to survival. Aristotle um, said that we are social animals endowed with reason. If you want to use the four drive theory to explain that, social is the drive to bond. Animal is the drive to acquire and the drive to defend. And endowed with reason is the drive to comprehend. So. I just want to share with you that this is what I think E.O. Wilson also referred to it the, as a consilience of knowledge that we have at our disposal and that we can educate with and educate from. This is much in contrast to the notion of who we are as Homo economicus, which doesn't have real scientific evidence. It is based on assumptions, but it is very powerful still. So here is a concept that's another building block on top of this kernel, which is the notion of dignity. Dignity, and I will just go through this, uh, is ultimately the balance of the four drives at a third, certain level where we feel we can survive. And we can call ourselves human, not animal, not feeling like we are treated like a resource, etc. But under the economistic perspective, with this alternate kernel of Homo economicus, dignity doesn't really exist. We're all whores. That's what Henry Minsberg describes this perspective and says, Michael Jensen, one of the proponents of this economistic perspective earlier on, 
opined we all have a price, like it or not, individuals are willing to sacrifice a little of almost anything we care to name, even reputation or morality, for a sufficiently large quantity of other desired things. And these things do not have to be money or even material goods. So basically, anything goes, we sell anything, trade off anything. There are no commitments. The humanistic perspective here, represented by Immanuel Kant, shares that he, Kant noted, uh, everything either has a price or a dignity. Whatever has a price can be replaced by something else or as its equivalent. On the other hand, whatever is above all price and therefore admits of no equivalent has a dignity. So in the context of humanistic leadership, what we're saying is that yes, there are certain things that adhere with the economistic logic and with the market pricing mechanism, but there are some things that escape it that are more important, which is dignity, that has dignity. That's, for example, a healthy environment, nature. It is also us as human beings, a child, mother, a worker, co-worker, etc. Okay, moving on from that as like sort of more an intuitive version of Kant's perspective on, on, lead, on, on dignity is this is one of the most powerful and successful ad campaigns ever run. And it probably is that because it speaks to something deep that we all know but that we need to be reminded of, which is dignity. And what it says here is that there are some, th some things money can't buy. For everything else, there is this credit card. And so in this image, it is family together in, <coughs> in nature, a healthy nature, not toxic nature, and people enjoying one another. Yeah, that's dignity. And that's ultimately some of the key objectives that people in the context of humanistic leadership need to be aware of and that we can actually lead towards these kind of scenarios where we appreciate that which doesn't have a price. And so for our educational purposes, we oftentimes, without knowing, apply the economistic model and say, all right, well, we assume in some way, unspoken, that the goal is wealth, power, or status, and the best way to get at these things is potentially by being emotionally intelligent, by talking about a purpose, by creating psychological safety, but ultimately it is there to create more money, wealth, outcomes of productivity, power, and status. Flipping that, the humanistic model will say, all right, well, it's not like we don't need money. The drive to acquire is clear. We need money. We want to defend that kind of wealth and status we, that we need. But there are other things that we need to have in balance so that we feel human. So there's a dignity threshold, and the ultimate goal of humanistic leadership is well-being and flourishing. So wealth and power play a role, but they are the instrument. Wealth and power and status play a role in terms of getting towards well-being and flourishing. So in many cases, in traditional business education, if it's a little bit more conscious, it does acknowledge these other humane pieces, but brings it into a framework where they are tools to advance economistic goals. In the humanistic model, it's a different operating system where we're saying, these tools, money is a tool, status is a tool, power is a tool, can help to support human flourishing. That's the distinction. I'll say it again. In one context, in the economistic context, the sun is profit, wealth, power, status. Everything else rotates around them. In the humanistic model, the well-being and flourishing our species is the sun and everything else circulates around them. So it's a fundamental paradigm shift in terms of who we are and what we want. Now, 
This is potentially intuitive, but at the same time, it's not practiced or experienced as a general reality in life, even though there are many organizations, some of them listed here, that actually use a humanistic leadership model and manage humanistically. And therefore, we say reality proves possibility. Humanistic leadership is actually something that's happening. It's oftentimes not seen as such because we don't necessarily discern it as such and uh, tell the stories or educate our students with those stories. There are a number of leaders here. It's Bob Chapman, it's Joe Kenner, it's the Abulish family, it's Ben and Jerry's, it's Anita Roddick and Bernie Glassman of organizations that we have chronicled over time that actually have intuited their own way into a humanistic model without knowing that this term actually sort of exists. And that speaks to the power of this. This is not conceptual. This is something that actually people experience and live into. And one of the more prominent uh, people that you might have heard of is Paul Pullman. Now, I want to end with this as a promise for humanistic leadership and conscious business education and change making in many ways that leadership is not the purview of just a few. Actually, leading humanistically is something we can all do. We can all become aware of our own dignity and the balance of the four drives. And we can all assess the dignity of others and the well-being and flourishing of others and the balance of their four drives and see what we can do to adjust this and maybe elevate, rebalance um, the four drives of ourselves and others in the context. We can do that with organizations and we can do that with society as well. And so once we get into this habit of seeing the world that way, we can also see ourselves as leaders. And especially us as professors, we're oftentimes getting questions it's like, how much are you having credibility teaching these things? It's easy when we teach concepts and knowledge that we just need to test. But in a context of leadership, and many universities are saying by now, we are educating the future leaders, positive leaders for society. How credible are we if we don't live leadership? And in this context, I just offer for you to think about what it means to be a professor in this humanistic context. How can we lead the classroom humanistically? How can we apply this to ourselves and maybe expand it to and extend it to our students? So this is the end of this foundational course. I uh, invite you to join the Humanistic Leadership Academy workshops that are ongoing to do maybe a certification full because we need better <laughs> leaders, better programmers, better educators. And here is the email if you want to be in touch, uh, humanisticmanagement.international, humanisticleadership.org, or my personal email, pearson at fordham.edu. I thank you so much. and. Uh, We'll end here.